Hi, welcome everyone to Dutch's webinar Wednesday. Uh, today, we'll, our lecture is foundational. It's part of our foundation, foundational lecture series that we've been doing um, here the first part of the year on the HPA access. My name is Amy Paoletti, and I'm a member of the Dutch education team. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking time to be with us today. Um, I think we'll have a, a great hour, hour and 15 minutes coming up. Um, a little bit about the outline or the objectives of the, today's lecture is uh, understanding uh, the assessment of the central peripheral system, recognizing the key components of the HPA access, discuss the physiology of the adrenal glands, identify the role of cortisol, and explain the importance of DHEA and the HPA access. So just a few housekeeping items um, before Dr. Jones starts. Um, we'll try to answer questions at the end of the webinar, at least at spend at least 15 minutes. I know we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll try to do a fair amount that we can. Um, so make sure to send your questions through the chat window. Um, also, please note that I did load the presentation slides in the handout section. So if you're interested in opening those up and following along while Dr. Jones speaks, uh, please do so. If there's any updates that she's made, we'll make sure to send you out um, the, the final version of the presentation uh, tomorrow. Uh, also, if you can't stay on with us uh, for the entire webinar, we will send the on-demand recording to you tomorrow as well. So uh, we definitely understand you guys have a bus busy schedule, but we want to make sure that you uh, get the recording and can hear all of this great information Dr. Jones is going to share. So I have mentioned Dr. Jones name several times here, and I know many of you that are online with us today are probably familiar with Dr. Jones, but just in case you're not, and this is the first webinar you've attended by uh, Precision Analytical Dutch Test, let me introduce her. Dr. Carrie Jones is the Medical Director for Precision Analytical. She is also a naturopathic doctor whose pa passion and expertise lies in the areas of hormonal, adrenal, and thyroid health. Dr. Jones graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon and went on to complete her residency in women's health, endocrinology, and hormones. She later graduated from Grand Canyon University with a master's in public health. So take it away, Dr. Jones. Excellent, wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Thank you to everybody who has joined. There we go. Getting my controls correct. OK. Thank you to everybody who has joined today. We are going to talk about the foundations of the HPA access. This is not going to be a how do you treat, but to understand the details of the HPA access. And then once you understand that, you can take it and run with it depending on how you treat. Or you can see a number of our other webinars where we do go into treatment uh, in detail. So first and foremost, we're going to just touch on the central and peripheral systems the key components of the HPA axis. We're gonna understand the physiology of the adrenal glands because I find um, when we get down to the deep, deep cellular level that sometimes practitioners uh, don't quite understand that. Understand the role of cortisol, recognize the importance of the cortisol awakening response, and touch a little bit on DHEA as we get into the HPA axis all within an hour. So first, so we are all on the exact same page we are discussing cortisol. Now, we're going to touch on cortisol, or DHEA just a little bit at the end, but we are discussing cortisol. Cortisol is known as a steroid hormone. It is derived from cholesterol. Therefore, cholesterol is really important to the creation of cortisol. It is lipophilic, meaning your, all your cells are surrounded by a lipid bilayer. And that lipid bilayer acts like a, it's a cell membrane, right? And it, it acts like a gatekeeper. And it doesn't want everything just to float through, but uh, lipophilic hormones such as cortisol can. It can float through and get through easily. So that's what I mean by it diffuses easily across those membranes because the lipid bilayer is like, hey, cortisol, long time no see, come on through. Then the difference between that and uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine is kind of huge. So norepinephrine and epinephrine are known as amine hormones. They come from tyrosine, not cholesterol, tyrosine. And they need a transporter because they're water soluble. They're hydrophilic, uh, therefore lipophobic. So they are not able to cross between the lipid bilayer very easily. This is why these transporters are so important to us. So let's second define the system. So we're talking about cortisol. We know it's a steroid hormone. Uh, we know it's 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 easy to uh, cross into a cell membrane. When we look at our nervous system, this is how it divides out. So the general nervous system is the big umbrella. We have the central nervous system, which is up in our brain and down through our spinal cord. 
And then we have the peripheral nervous system. Our peripheral nervous system divides out into the somatic and autonomic, and the autonomic divides out into the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, and now, of course, a lot of practitioners and researchers include your enteric, which is, of course, in your, in your GI tract, your enteric or your intrinsic under that autonomic. We are going to focus in the autonomic, um, parasympathetic, sympathetic, but mostly really the autonomic, sympathetic as it relates to stress um, going forward. So when people talk about the nervous system, they talk about fight or flight. That's what we're going to cover today when it comes to cortisol. So third, what is the HPA axis? What are we even talking about when we talk about cortisol and stress and this axis? So maybe if you're brand new to the physiology of the adrenal glands, this is how it works. You have your hypothalamus in your brain. Your hypothalamus releases CRH. It is sometimes called CRF, depending on where you read. That then tells the pituitary to release ACTH. ACTH then tells the adrenal glands to release aldosterone, DHEA, cortisol. And actually, ACTH doesn't um, release uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, but it does help with the creation of your norepinephrine and epinephrine. So as a little reminder again, what are the hormones made by the adrenal glands? It's these four. So cortisol, DHEA, DHEAS, aldosterone, norepinephrine, and epinephrine in, in a simplified manner. These are the four. When we talk about the adrenal glands, it's not all cortisol all the time. There are other layers and other glands that go with it. Now, talking about the glands and talking about the HPA axis, we know that key disease states come out of it. We know that you can be either Addison's or Cushing's if you're at either end of the spectrum. So Addison's is the actual autoimmune disease of the adrenal gland, resulting in too little production of cortisol and aldosterone. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Cushing's. Cushing's syndrome, excessive amounts of cortisol in the body, regardless of cause, usually it's steroid use. Cushing's disease, excessive cortisol due to a tumor. And so as we know in medicine, you are often either classified one end of the spectrum or the other and otherwise told you're normal if you're in the middle. If you don't have Addison's and you don't have Cushing's, then congratulations. I'm sorry you're tired. I'm sorry you have all these symptoms, but you, you're, you're considered normal. And what we would like to put forth and what we have been uh, talking about uh, at Precision Analytical for a couple years now is taking the functional endocrinology model of the HPA axis and adapting it to look like this. So that gray area, we actually gave a color. So if you're Addison's on the, on the far left and your Cushing's on the far right, and then we kind of go through gradual stages, right? You go, you, you can be absolutely normal in the middle, but as your cortisol starts to move up, maybe it's adaptive, meaning it's moving up for a reason to help you fight a fight, to help you get over a stress, to help you deal with an infection, and then it will go back down. Or maybe it stays high because you have a lot going on. And as a result, your body is pumping out a lot of cortisol. Not Cushing's level, but enough high that you really are feeling the effects. The opposite end of the spectrum, we have low cortisol. So not Addison's low, but you're starting to get low, right? You're starting to have a down regulation of your cortisol production. And so our cortisol drops into the adaptive, eventually it's into the low. It's not autoimmune, it's not Addison's but you can have low cortisol and of course feel the effects. And so you may find yourself or your patients are swimming somewhere in these colors, which is what we think is really important in the endocrinology, the traditional endocrinology to take into account. It's not, in our case, it's not all black and green, right? It's not just Addison's, Cushing's or normal. There's this whole other colorful spectrum in between and that's where we work and that's where our test comes into play. So we have to identify the diseases when you see it, like, right? We have to do something about it. Um, when we test and we find it, we have to go, all right, this is something that we have to um, address right away. This could be a medical, a real serious medical issue. But otherwise, generalized HPA axis dysfunction is what more commonly occurs in the system. And that's what we address. That's what we cover on the day-to-day -day as functional uh, practitioners. So how cortisol is made is important to properly understanding the HPA axis dysfunction. If you're going to treat somebody who has low or high cortisol, you have to get down to the cellular level to understand how did you even get made in the first place? What was the signaling cascade that set it off? And honestly, where in the cell am I going after? Where in the cell could be dysfunctional? And that's 
that's a true problem. So if we look at a typical steroid biochemistry pathway, we know that these pathways are every single cell laid out in an eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. So we know these steroid pathways are how hormones are made in ovarian cells, in adrenal cells, in testicular cells, what have you. And it doesn't really actually work this way. You can't just insert yourself wherever you want um, in this pathway and then hope to affect everything downstream. Because it's a steroid pathway to make cortisol in the first place, we have to start at the top. So looking at cortisol, some hormones are made from circulating precursors, but cortisol production is not made this way. It is not made from circulating pregnenolone or progesterone. And so Dutch has another webinar that Dr. Tom Williams, where he talked about uh, the pregnenolone or the progesterone steel and how this is, it's physiologically not how cortisol is actually made despite uh, it being taught over and over and over again. So where does it all start? Where does cortisol production, how do you make it if it's not made from circulating pregnenolone or circulating progesterone? Well, first it starts in the brain. You have to get that signaling down pat. So if you're doing any kind of adrenal treatment, protocol, program, whatever, you have to make sure you address signaling first and foremost. If the brain ain't healthy, you are not gonna have good levels of CRH and ACTH coming out to tell the adrenal glands what to do. So if we look at CRH, and like I said earlier, it's sometimes called CRF, it is encoded by the CRH gene. So if you're into genomics and the company you're using tests CRH, you can absolutely see how this is working. It's made in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, and its main job is to tell the pituitary to make ACTH. So this means anything that affects the hypothalamus is going to affect the top, top signaling for how you make cortisol. Once you're in the pituitary, you release ACTH, right? ACTH, its main job is to bind to the adrenal gland and cause the release of cortisol primarily, that's, that's its first thing, and then DHEA, DHEAS, and aldosterone. Now you might be thinking, well, what about those catecholamines? Well, ACH doesn't actually stimulate catecholamine release, but it does help with catecholamine synthesis and with the sympathetic nervous system and, and cortisol itself. So it's, it's, it's ACTH helps build it, um, but it's our sympathetic response of fight or flight that causes them to be released um, out of the vesicle in the first place. So ACTH is helpful here. It's just not helpful like it is for cortisol. Now, once you've got the signaling dialed in, you whatever, again, treatment plan, protocol, what have you, is address the brain health and the signaling health, we move down to the adrenal glands. We know, uh, assuming you have two kidneys, you have two adrenal glands, you should have two adrenal glands, where you make your adrenal hormones. The adrenal glands are divided up into layers. So first of all, it's surrounded by a capsule. And then we have the adrenal cortex layer. And the adrenal cortex layer um, are where you have your uh, zona glomerulosa, your zona fasciculata, and your zona reticularis. And if you look on this drawing, you'll see the zona fasciculata, which is the pink section in the middle, the, the, the pink pink, the pink and polka dot, um, that really truly is a good representation of how thick your zona fasciculata is. It's the thicker section of your cortex because cortisol production is so critically important in your body. Glomerulosa, not so thick. Reticularis, not so thick. Not as thick, so to speak. Um, but that fasciculata, that's the, that's, that's the important part. So once ACTH binds to the cortex and it binds to the zona fasciculata with a cell in there, this is what happens. So we've, we've got our little diagram of ACTH coming in and, and binding into the adrenal gland. And the first thing that happens here is the star protein binds to cholesterol. Star protein binds to cholesterol and moves into the mitochondria. So you can see as you're listening to this, I'm already giving you the key steps of how you're going to do any kind of treatment for the HPA axis. You're gonna start with the brain because that's where all the signaling comes and goes. You're gonna evaluate their lipid profile. You're gonna evaluate their, 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 their uh, cellular health, right? Because if they have uh, cell membrane issues, if they have problems with their lipid bilayer, then cortisol is gonna struggle to get through even though it should get through. And now we're in the mitochondria. They have mitochondrial issues. You're going to struggle here too. 
So star protein binds to cholesterol. That turns into pregnenolone. This is the very first section of steps for all of your steroid hormone productions, all of them. We're talking about cortisol, but this is the same for progesterone, estrogen, testosterone. This is the first step in the relative cell that your body makes them. But since we're talking about uh, cortisol, we're in the fasciculata. Pregnenolone goes to the endoplasmic reticulum to form progesterone, which comes back out, converts into 11-deoxycortisol. 11-deoxycortisol comes back in the mitochondria, becomes cortisol. So now we've started, gone out, come back in, and ended up with cortisol. And then cortisol goes back out into circulation. So mitochondrial health is ridiculously important in the zona fasciculata for cortisol production. So let's talk about the zona fasciculata. Like I've said, it makes cortisol. When you get stressed out, when you have a fight or flight response, cortisol is not actually stored for immediate release. I know, believe it or not, it's your catecholamines that go first. Cortisol is a little slow. It takes about 10 minutes for it to be created and released. Its normal half-life with a healthy liver is about one to two hours, depending on research. It is bound up by something called cortisol binding globulin or otherwise known as transcortin and albumin. Now cortisol binding globulin, much like all your other binding globulins, sex hormone binding globulin, thyroid binding globulin, they're all influenced by the same things such as birth control pill or insulin or inflammation. So if you have somebody and they're on the birth control pill and you're evaluating their other binding globulins, maybe sex hormone binding globulin, um, it tends to push the binding globulins up. That oral estrogen tends to, to push them up. Keep in mind, it might do the same for cortisol binding globulin. So cortisol binding globulin is going to bind up free cortisol so you won't have as much free cortisol in circulation. Just like sex hormone binding globulin binds up testosterone or thyroid binding globulin binds up thyroid. So keep that in mind. Cortisol binding globulin does also bind up progesterone. So if you have, if you're doing serum testing of cortisol binding globulin and it's elevated and you're focused on cortisol, take a peek at progesterone. If her progesterone is low, it's possible, of course, she's not ovulating. It's possible her corpus luteum is not that healthy. It's also possible her progesterone is getting all bound up if her binding globulin is high. Now, we all know that children, our hormones are like children. They cannot be unattended at any time. So your body keeps them on the binding globulin and only a teeny tiny amount of free and in circulation, less than 5%. But it is that less than 5% that's the active form. And it's the active form that can bind to receptors and do the things. So let's focus in on that cortisol. Like I've said earlier, it is produced by the adrenal gland in the mitochondria. So I just wanna to touch on that for a second. Um, again, we, it, the, the discussion on mitochondria is much longer uh, than an hour, but I will just have a couple slides to just remind you of where you can look and where you can go and, and, and how you can help with the mitochondria. So as I was said uh, a few slides ago, cortisol production starts and finishes in the mitochondria, right? Starts and ends in the mitochondria. So mitochondrial health is critical. What screws up your mitochondria? Unfortunately, a lot of things do. A lot of things, chemicals, toxins, pesticides, herbicides, mycotoxins and molds, viruses like Epstein-Barr and this current one we have, parasites, heavy metals, crappy diets that don't give you a lot of nutrients or antioxidants, a lot of medications destroy mitochondria. That's an easy one you can look up online. You can look them up on pharmacy medication or pharmacy websites, uh, up to date things like that. They'll tell you if they've got mitochondrial issues. Ongoing inflammation and oxidative stress will affect your mitochondria. Alcohol, uh, yes, unfortunately, even the organic biodynamic type. Again, alcohol is alcohol. Copper toxicity, and then lack of antioxidants, lack of oxygen lack of iron so if you're if you your patient is iron anemic iron deficient um, or glucose they're struggling with their glucose so what helps what helps your mitochondria well obviously addressing the cause so you're going to go back a slide and work through that with your patient and see what's going on and then here are just some examples of cofactors transporters 
antioxidants and, and whatnot that are needed for the mitochondria. A lot of these you're going to recognize, CoQ10, of course. When we look at the complexes um, in the electron transport chain for the mitochondria, CoQ10 is a big one. Your lipoic acid, your vitamin C, your selenium, a lot of B vitamins are involved um, in, in, that, uh, in that electron transport chain and, of course, in your Krebs cycle. Magnesium and zinc. Um, manganese superoxide dismutase is huge. Superoxide dismutase is a really big, important antioxidant um, necessary right in is going through the electron transport chain. Copper and iron, I mentioned earlier, glutathione, N-acetylcysteine, sulforaphane, uh, PQQ, curcumin, EGCG, other polyphenols, and then intermittent fasting, cold exposure such as cold showers, uh, cold plunges, um, you know, swimming in cold rivers, and the cold exposure is shivering. It's the active shivering. So cold exposure can go two ways. Cold exposure, one can help you with resiliency if you suppress your shiver response. And if you allow the shiver response, then that activates your brown fat, not your white fat, but your brown fat. And you have a lot of mitochondria. It's, have, it's very mitochondrial rich in your brown fat. So the active shivering actually can help um, one with potentially weight loss, but two for it, it's because it's, it's, it's activating uh, the mitochondria. Weights, weightlifting, oxygen. Oxygen is proper breathing. So breathing through your nose as opposed to your mouth, getting evaluated for sleep apnea and snoring. Um, how, how your uh, body posture is right now, listening to this webinar, you know, are you sitting upright? Are, are, is, your, are, is your head in alignment over your shoulders? Do you have your chin pulled back? Or are you looking down? Are you looking down at your phone? Are you looking down at your computer? Are you just sort of like hanging out in your chair? Um, that all affects the way we circulate, get oxygen in, and then circulate it up and down from our brain uh, down, you know, through our, our uh, lymphatics and or through our, our capillary arterial system. And then on top of that, we're affecting our lymphatics based on our posture with this for the same reasons. And then red and near infrared light therapy. I get asked like, why? What does red near infrared light, light therapy do? It does uh, two big things, I'll tell you with the mitochondria. One, in your mitochondria, it, again, in that electron transport chain, you have something called cytochrome C. And cytochrome C has a photon receptor on it, which means um, it, it's receptive to light, specifically red and near infrared light as it penetrates the skin. So if you have red and near infrared light devices um, that you use medically, then that can help activate mitochondria. It's the same for getting a little sun exposure, getting a little sunshine, a little sunlight on the skin. Um, it penetrates the skin. It can be helpful for activating that cytochrome C. Um, now, the other thing is that it can help mitochondrial biogenesis. Intermittent fasting and cold exposure can do the same thing. Mitochondrial biogenesis, for um, a super quick, easy analogy that I, um, just, just so you understand, uh, if, if I'm a mitochondria and I'm missing my right arm, and you're a mitochondria and you're missing your left arm, but otherwise we function just fine, we're just missing like my right arm and your left arm, and we see each other and we recognize if we squished together and became a bigger, badder, awesomer mitochondria with a functioning right and left arm, we can do that. and help the body even more. So that's mitochondrial biogenesis. And what encourages that, um, that, that elongating together of two of them or squishing together and making bigger for, uh, to, so that if like, broken parts of one and broken parts of the other, they're made up for in the other one. Uh, that intermittent fasting, that cold exposure, that red and near infrared light therapy um, can do that. And I thought, man, that's so cool that the, that the little mitochondria have figured that out. Imagine if, if if, if humans could figure that out, like I, like I've got the best of me and, but I've got some parts I'm not thrilled with and you've got the best of you. And if we came together, like we would be amazing. We'd be like Avengers. So it doesn't work that way in humans, but it does work in the mitochondria. So now continuing on in our cortisol, you've, you've made cortisol. You have, now you've, you've healthy mitochondria. You've actually produced the cortisol. What do you do with it? Well, you can deactivate it to cortisone. Cortisone is inactive. That primarily happens in places like the kidney, but also the salivary glands, the sweat glands. It's, it's to protect the mineral corticoid receptors there. Um, and then, or you can reactivate to cortisol, and, and you often reactivate in fat cells, in the liver, uh, parts of your intestine. So your body makes cortisol first. The HPA axis produces cortisol. And then, and then depending where you are in the body, what's so cool is that you can be so active in some parts 
and inactive in other parts, depending if you need cortisol or if you're trying to protect the mineral corticoid receptors, then you'll get deactivated. So it does this through this nifty little enzyme called 11-beta-HSD. So 11-beta-HSD1 keeps you at cortisol and 11-beta-HSD2 deactivates you to cortisone. There's a lot of neat research about this enzyme because um, 11 beta HSD1 is going to push you into cortisol. And so they have been, you know, starting to evaluate that with things like anxiety or even um, in the adipose tissue itself, uh, cardiometabolic disease, are um, because of cortisol's effect. It's like I said, this enzyme's high in adipose tissue. So if you have a lot of adipose tissue and this enzyme is active there, it's turned on more than the average bear, then you're going to have a lot of cortisol that will go out in circulation. They're also researching this enzyme for the other way. If you have a broken ability to make cortisone, so your 11-beta-HSD2, they're finding um, if, if your gene has a mutation, so you can't deactivate your cortisol very well, they're linking it a lot to hypertension. There's a lot of neat, in interesting research out there. So the body, you know, we have to find other ways to dampen down the cortisol if it's not going to deactivate into cortisone if you don't have that ability. And so this enzyme, if you just search PubMed, you'll find some really cool stuff on it. And I'm starting to find more in, um, you know, like the, the herbal uh, literature on what natural things might help to um, affect this enzyme one way or the other. Well, then you have to break your cortisol down and it does so primarily in the liver. And it does throw through your 5-alpha and your 5-beta reductase. Yep, the same family. It's the same family when we think of your testosterone and DHT, uh, your 5-alpha and 5-beta reductase uh, for the androgen side. Um, same family uh, that does it for cortisol. You have a few different 5-alpha and 5-betas. Again, family, not necessarily individual, same enzyme. Um, but you can be 5-alpha dominant in your testosterone. You can be 5-alpha dominant in your progesterone. You can be 5-alpha dominant in your cortisol breakdown. So what that looks like, especially on the Dutch test, is you will come through a lot more is this metabolite called THF. If you're THF dominant, that means you had a lot of cortisol and it's being broken down um, into THF. Now, on the other side is your THE, tetrahydrocortisone, THE. So if you have a lot of THE, you had a lot of cortisone. That's because it's, it's irreversible. Once you make it, you know you know what it was um, coming from the body. So by knowing this information, I can go, oh, I, I, know, I know how much you were making and, and what you used to be, whether you used to be a lot of a cortisol dominant person or a cortisone dominant person. I can tell just because we understand metabolism and how cortisol breaks down. So now that you're, you're a free cortisol, you're out of the mitochondria, you've, you've, your 11 beta HSD1 is kicked in and you've, you're more free cortisol, you have to bind to the glucocorticoid receptor to make the action happen. So let's talk about that cortisol binding and how that works. And this is a little bit of a simplified version, but I don't wanna leave it out because cortisol binding to the glucocorticoid receptor is really important. We often forget about our receptors. We are so focused on the hormones that we forget about the receptors they actually bind to. So the GR, uh, the glucocorticoid receptor, it hangs out in the cytosol, resting with proteins like heat shock protein 90 and heat shock protein 70. They keep it capable, ever ready, and ready to bind. So when the cortisol diffuses through the cell membrane, it binds to the glucocorticoid receptor and your heat shock proteins release. So you need the heat shock, heat shock proteins there in the first place to stabilize, prepare, and get ready the receptor, but once cortisol is on, they release and float out. They float out into circulation. So the cortisol glucocorticoid receptor as a unit moves to the nucleus of the cell, binds to the GRE, which is a glucocorticoid response element, and that begins gene transcription. Crazy, right? So it looks like this. You can see cortisol coming through the cell. HSD2 can stop it right there and deactivate it to cortisone, or it can allow it through. It binds to the glucocorticoid receptor. Your heat shock proteins pop off. Everything moves down into the nucleus and you start mRNA transcription. So these heat shock proteins, why are they important? Why do you care about heat shock proteins? Well, they're from the uh, heat shock protein gene, oddly enough, and they stabilize and activate over 200 proteins. Some are really common to you, NF-kappa-beta, JAK-STAT, tumor suppressor P53, 
FOXO, MAPK. I mean, there's a lot of things, right, that are familiar. Heat shock proteins are really important. And this is what I think, this is the picture I always envision in my head when we talk about heat shock proteins. So protein folding, again, we're talking about your, glu your receptor, your, 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 pro your um, glucocorticoid receptor in, in this instance. Protein folding occurs in a cellular compartment called the endoplasmic reticulum. This is a vital cellular process because proteins must be correctly folded into specific three-dimensional shapes in order to function correctly. Unfolded or misfolded proteins contribute to the pathology of many diseases. And I can't remember if it was this article or a different article I was reading. If you think about it, uh, um, your heat, like all of this in the endoplasmic reticulum, it's not like they, it's not like the stuff in your cell, um, you know, adheres to the mandate of staying six feet apart. Like, everything's crammed in there and floating around and they bump into each other. And so you can have dysfunctional receptors in, 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 in proteins and in, in even um, mitochondria because everything's floating and bumping into each other. And as you're constantly bumping into this, you still like it unfolds. And then the heat shock proteins are like, no, let's refold you correctly. And then something bumps into it and unfolds and oh, no, and you have to fold it correctly again. And so we need these heat shock proteins to keep it like the fitted bed sheet on the right so that if your kid comes in you know, to your linen closet and pulls it out, you're like, no, and you can fold it back up again and put it back. As opposed to on the left-hand side, if something comes in your linen closet, pulls it out and puts it away like that, like that to a binding cortisol, like that's not gonna work. That's no good, you, you can't do that. And so even just the act of being human and having a lot of things in your cells can cause misfolding, which is why the health of our heat shock proteins is really important. So the other role of these heat shock proteins is obviously protein folding, but to protect against, surprise, surprise, heat stress, which is the name, but they've soon found out like, wow, it actually protects against a lot of things, cold stress, UV light stress, wound healing, inflammation, alcohol, metals, starvation, hypoxia, external stressors, et cetera. They also help with protein degradation. So once you're a protein and you're done, like you need to go, uh, your time is up. Like they help sort of shuffle that along, you know, or usher that along. Like let's let's break you down. They have a high uh, high affinity ATP binding site. So when a heat shock protein is not interacting, um, then it's in its ATP bound state. So if it's waiting for cortisol and it's just hanging out there, then ATP is there. So again, ATP um, and mitochondrial production are important, are important for these heat shock proteins. So the two I mentioned, heat shock protein 90 and heat shock protein 70, they do different, completely different things. So heat shock protein 90, which is on your glucocorticoid receptor and important, when cortisol binds and, and this releases, think about it, it's kind of like a, um, it's like a, it's like a cytokine in a sense, right? It's like a, it's a, it's a signaler because it activates both the innate and the adaptive immune system. Cortisol has bound to the glucocorticoid receptor. That means something's wrong, right? That means something's wrong. So it can act as a damp. So a damp is damage associated molecular pattern due to cellular damage. Um, so right, and there's damps and pamps. So this is dam damps due to cellular damage. And it does increase NF kappa beta because your, your body is like something must be wrong. Let's activate the system using heat shock protein 90. So we need it to, for proper receptor binding of not only cortisol, but aldosterone, astro, your estrogens, progesterone, and your androgens. So we're talking cortisol in this hour, but it's really important for binding of all your hormones. So its dysregulation can lead to carcinogenesis, autoimmunity, and or chronic disease, and heat shock protein 90 inhibitors are being studied for cancer treatment and to reduce autoimmune flares and rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uveitis, colitis, alcohol, liver injury, and lung inflammation. And if you take a step back and think of it, why they need a heat shock protein 90 inhibitor because they don't want it to float away and activate the immune system. But why is it activating the immune system in the first place? Oh, right, because these hormones have bound. Now, cortisol being the, I think, this is my personal opinion, the big one, the big influential one, um, and, and the one that maybe is the most... Um, overlooked and how it affects our immune system, right? And, and our stress response and how we, how we handle that, I think is really important. So as we know, a lot of people are walking out there or walking around out there in a very high stress state and they have cortisol binding to their 
glucocorticoid receptor all the time, but that's it, then activating your, your heat shock protein 90. And it, if your patients with autoimmunity, like really talk to them about stress and really talk to them about their stress response and really st talk to them about stress mitigation because it could be a huge influencer. And this is just one way through the heat shock protein 90. Thankfully, your body, as usual, is smart and it gives you a heat shock protein 70. So when it's activated, it generally suppresses pro-inflammatory genes. So it blocks the transcription of NF-kappa beta, does the opposite of heat shock 90. It activates an anti-inflammatory cascade. It increases your Treg cells. And in animal studies, inducing heat shock protein 70 downregulates autoimmune arthritis development. So high expression of heat shock protein 70 allows cells to, to survive injuries that are lethal under normal conditions. Like how crazy is that? And increased heat shock protein 70 levels leads to inhibition of programmed cell death through heat shock protein 70 mediated interactions at several points of the apoptotic signaling pathways. Well, now you might be thinking, well, I don't know what to do. What do I do? Do I, how do I lower 90 and raise 70? So it's really, a lot of it's about, um, it's, it's about, it's, it's about balance for one. It's kind of like Goldilocks, but we all know we need some stress and, and it's about our resiliency. So we like heat shock protein 70, but 90 comes along with it. And so we'd like more 70 than we want 90. And so we're trying to do things to raise 70, such as these things. Now, these are primarily cell and animal studies, but if we add a little bit more of this into our lifestyle and we use stress to our advantage and, and recover, recover, use recovery to our advantage, take care of ourselves, um, then in the end, that's where I'm finding in, in the research, um, we kind of get the best of both worlds. So the most important thing I want you to take home about this slide, the absolute most important thing is the number one bullet point on there is dark chocolate. Boom, done. Like, there you go. That's the most important thing you need to know. Uh, but you'll see other stuff on there. Saffron, rhodiola, oregano oil, shishandra, broccoli sprouts, or sulforaphane, curcumin, sauna, right? Eleuthero, glutamine, arginine, uh, allicin, and garlic. Whey protein, propolis, resveratrol, red wine, particularly in Syrah or Cab Franc. Um, the red wine for Syrah and Cab Franc are because that's the wine that's the highest in resveratrol. Be careful, it's still in alcohol. Calorie restriction and certain uh, studied probiotics. And so again, these are cell and animal studies, um, but dark chocolate's the number one bullet point and that's really all that matters. So these things might help you raise your heat shock 70. All right, so now we're gonna continue through the zones. We've gone through fasciculata, we understand the mitochondria, we understand how important it is to improve mitochondrial health. We understand mitochondrial biogenesis. We want bigger, better, badder mitochondria with functioning left and right arms. We understand that little enzyme, 11 beta HSD, that turns it on and turns it off. And then we understand that in order to bind, we have to work with our heat shock proteins. And if we have dysfunctional heat shock proteins, we're gonna have dysfunctional sh fitted sheets in our, in our uh, linen closets of our, of our body. And so we wanna make sure we eat dark chocolate primarily and m keep our heat shock protein 70 really, really healthy. So let's move through the zone. Let's go through glomerulosa. Glomerulosa, of course, is aldosterone. This is our salt water balance. Influences the reabsorption of sodium and the excretion of potassium. It is controlled uh, mostly by angiotensin II, a little bit by ACTH. And when cortisol binds to the mineral corticoid receptors, we look like that pufferfish and we have sodium and water retention. Back to that a little, that enzyme, 11 beta HSD2, it's heavily concentrated in areas with mineral corticoid receptors. Because if you're a sweat gland, if you're a kidney, um, if you're an intestine and you have a lot of mineral corticoid, a salivary gland, you have a lot of mineral corticoid receptors, and your cortisol is just slamming it, you're gonna get a lot of this sodium water retention. And so the body's going, enough cortisol, enough, I'm going to deactivate you. And that's why it plants that enzyme there uh, to try, to try to do its job and deactivate cortisol and protect the receptors. So this is one reason for in those high cortisol folk, they may also complain of water retention, tight rings, tight socks, puffy face, things like that. And as you work with their cortisol balance, their, their stress response, um, their resiliency, that they notice that their salt water balance gets better. Aldosterone, what happens, um, in case you've forgotten, increases blood pressure, 
in, because you have increased sodium retention, increased potassium release, and then increased extracellular volume or water retention. So this is the actual cascade mechanism um, that happens if you've forgotten. Now we go to the reticularis. The reticularis is where you make your sex hormones. So in women, the reticularis are where you make all of your DHEAS, all of it, all of it endogenously. So if you run a DHEAS marker, whether it's on our test in Dutch, whether it's a serum test, know that all the S comes from the adrenal gland, the zona reticularis. Um, if you're taking supplements, if you take DHEA as a supplement, it is converted into S in the intestines and in the liver. So um, you then, it, so if you take it as a supplement and then test your DHAS, you don't actually know if that's what you're making or if that's due to the supplement or what percentage that is um, because you're on a supplement. You would have to go off the supplement for a good couple of days, get yourself back to a baseline and then test and then you can see what's going on. Unfortunately, as you know, hormones are not geotagged. So I have no idea um, and I get asked this a lot. I, people will say, um, well, how do I know which, where that's coming from? Like this DHAS, did it come from my liver because I'm taking it? Did it come from my intestine because I'm taking it? That my adrenal's making it? I'm like, I, you know, if it, if it showed up geotagged, that'd be great that I could backtrack and tell you where it's from. They're not geotagged. 80% um, of your DHEA, no S, it, made in your adrenal glands. Women, your other 20% are made in the ovaries in your theca cells. 50% of your androstenedione, the other 50% are made in the theca cells. 25% of your testosterone, um, are, again, made in the adrenals. With testosterone, roughly 25% in the ovaries and the theca cells, and the other 50% are made out in the peripheral tissue, oftentimes the adipose, because it's made from the androstenedione and converted into testosterone out there in the peripheral tissue. But just in the adrenals, all the S, 80% of the DHEA, 50% of the androstenedione, 25% of the testosterone. So you can see if you have dysfunctional HPA axis, you're going to have dysfunctional androgens. Men, same. All your DHEAS. So the same rules apply for endogenously versus supplements to you as well. 80% of your DHEA, the rest is made in your testicles. Less than 10% of your androstenedione and less than 5% of your testosterone because those are made in your testicles. Um, but really in the male adrenals, the DHEA, DHEAS, that's, that's really the androgen that's concentrated here. So DHEAS is the most abundant circulating steroid in the whole body. DHEAS is uh, inactive. Once the sulfate goes on, then it cannot bind to receptors and cannot do the things. You have to take the S off to, to make it active. So it can't cross into the blood-brain barrier as, as with the S on, um, but once made from within the brain, it can cross out. And DHEAS has no diurnal pattern, but DHEA does have a diurnal pattern. So please be atten aware of what you're testing and when you're testing it. So on the left-hand side to get the S on, which is inactive basically, you're gonna be looking at your SALT SNP, specifically, most commonly your SALT 2A1, um, but the SALT2 family in general um, are good indicators for you. Sulfotransferase requires uh, PAPS. PAPS is the sulfate donor. Um, so if you have enough sulfate to put the S on, sulfotransferase, transfer the sulfo, right? Transfer the S on. To get it off, so now you're active and combine the receptors and do the things, you use the steroid sulfatase enzyme from the STS SNP. This requires cysteine. Cysteine. So if you're struggling to get the um, S off and maybe you're cysteine deficient, uh, you maybe looked at some glutathione markers just as an example, um, then you may need to increase cysteine to help with this whole process. If you're into genomics, check out your STS SNP and see what's going on there, just like you can check out your SALT2 family and um, get a good idea of what's happening with your DHEA. So lastly, we're gonna move into the medulla, which are your catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine. These are pre-stored and ready to be released immediately when triggered by sympathetic signaling. The half-life is just a few minutes. They, unless, unless you have a problem with your MAO or your COMT. So, what, and I tell this story a lot, um, and she knows I do, do it. My best friend, when we, if we are stressed out by the exact same thing, I will get over it and she will not. She will be stressed out and kind of buzzy all day. Come to find out she has a very slow MAO. And so she has a hard time breaking down her catecholamines compared to me. 
So her stay in her system longer and she can't clear it out. Um, so keep that in mind if you have somebody who does experience, ask them that question. When you get stressed out, how long does it take you to come down and to, and to have that stressful feeling move through your body? If it feels like a normal amount of time, um, it's just a good indicator. And if he or she says, man, I, it takes like all day, you know, it can take me hours, um, then suspect a slow MAO or COMT. So speaking of stress, in which a it's stress, it's the state in which homeostasis is threatened or perceived to be from emotional, physical, psychological, environmental, and chemical stressors. And the thing about stress that we all know is that the way your body reacts to stress is if stress is actually happening to you, if it's anticipated or if it's imagined, meaning it doesn't have to be real. You can be making it up in your head and your body will react the exact same way. You can be anticipating stress that may or may not ever happen and your stress response is going to happen anyway as if it does occur because it's a protection survival thing. If you think there's a tiger, the body's like, well, crap, I'm not gonna wait around to find out if there is. We're gonna react to prepare you in case there really is a tiger. So keep this in mind if you're a person who makes mountains out of molehills, just saying, um, that these the, and the anticipated and the imagined um, can really do a number on the HPA axis. Common symptoms, we all know when you're, when you're fired up in the fight or flight, we've got right hypertension, like hyper, um, our high heart rate, and we're breathing heavy, we're breathing shallow, paling or flushing, or alternating between both. Who, who alternates between paling and flushing? Hot flushes, maybe, night sweats? Inhibition of stomach and upper intestinal action, so constipation, problems with digestion, indigestion. General effects on the sphincters of the body, constructures of blood vessels in many parts of the body. Um, right, we break down, we want all the nutrients, so we start to break down fats and glucose for muscular action. Our blood vessels dilate so we can get everything out to the muscles to run. We get dry eye, dry mouth, dry skin, dry vagina. We're thinking menopause, but stress plays a role. Dilated pupils, relaxation of bladder. Who comes to you and says that they have trouble holding their urine, that maybe they leak? Could be hormones for sure, could be anatomical. Cortisol could play a role. Inhibition of erection, loss of libido, loss of hearing, tunnel vision, reflexes, acceleration of reflexes, shaking. So this is all normal for a short-term stress response. Short-term, right? Short-term being the operative word. But in a moderate to long-term stress response, we get this HPA axis dysfunction. So chronic stress in any, in any form can result in a hypersensitive or hyperreactive stress response. And it happens because the amygdala in our brain, our amygdala is one of our fear-based conditioning glands, um, fires quicker and quicker and quicker to tell the HPA access, run, run, fight or flight, oh my gosh, scary, be hypervigilant, you know, it's, it's, this is stressful. And so it conditions itself, the amygdala gets conditioned that everything's scary. And so it's constantly telling the HPA access um, that everything's scary. So your patient says, stress affects me more and I'm, and I'm quicker to react. Um, you know, I'm snappier, I'm more irritated. Uh, it, it, it just, I, with these repeated occurrences. And I used to be able to handle stress, but now I can't. Why can't I handle stress anymore? And this is what happens in this result. So in an acute stressful response, we should get a mild stressor. We get a rise in our reaction, and then our parasympathetic should go, okay, it's cool. We're done. I've got you. Let's relax. We have a parasympathetic rebound and return to normal. But unfortunately what happens that we know, because um, we see it in our patients all the time and as practitioners, you may be approaching burnout yourself. We get the stress and we get a, now a strong, because we've been conditioned, we've been conditioned, we've been conditioned. We get a strong sympathetic stress response. We don't get the appropriate parasympathetic response and we, we don't really recover to normal. And this of course happens gradually over time, but it can be really detrimental to our health and the health of our patients. So this is important because the less flexible the whole body system is, the slower the system is to adapt. We can't survive and we can't thrive in our environment. So when, these, when the zombie apocalypse happens, you know, we're just, we're just not able to adapt. We're not able to, to, to thrive and, and to really, really live, live it out and get ahead. So 
cortisol progression in a chronic state, initially we head up towards the uh, right-hand side with the adaptive cortisol and the high cortisol. But over time, we start to go down the other way. We start to get into that negative feedback loop where cortisol constantly bombarding the brain. The brain goes, wow, this is enough. And the negative feedback loop kicks in. Down goes CRH, down goes ACTH, down goes cortisol. And now we're down into a low cortisol state. So if you see somebody in your practice who has low cortisol, they probably had high cortisol not that long ago, and that feedback loop kicked in, assuming they're not on anything suppressive. So stressors, inflammation, infection, et cetera, negative feedback loop, negative feedback loop, and now you have low cortisol. So over time, again, if you have someone in your practice, if they're currently high cortisol, know that they, if they don't, if they, you don't do anything about it and they don't do anything about it, it's going to become low. And if they are low, that they were high and we need to undo that feedback loop. So a normal response looks like this. It follows a circadian rhythm at, at, the, at the direction of our clock genes in our brain. So on waking, our cortisol's, you know, nice and low, we just woke up. And then over time, our cortisol goes up and then gradually comes down until it's nice and low before we go to bed. We want our cortisol to be like the sun and we want our um, uh, melatonin to be like the moon. So cortisol is up in the day, then down, so then melatonin can come out. Now, this is obviously for somebody who's on like a day shift clock. Um, this can look very different somebody for somebody on the night shift clock. So the four point collection is a great starting point. It covers the general circadian rhythm. You can, if like Dutch testing, you can look at metabolites, which are the THE and THF. You can get an evaluation of that 11 beta HSD enzyme I've talked about, and we can look at cortisone. So now we wanna maybe even expand that and look at something called the cortisol awakening response because we're all about resilience. Not only is it important to look at the cortisol itself, but how is it, how is it produced um, and when? Timing is everything. So the CAR, the cortisol awakening response is used to determine resiliency and flexibility. And so they said that the car could be a result of anticipated demands of the upcoming day, stress anticipation, and really could give us insight and support coping with daily life stress. And I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people are struggling to cope with daily life stress. So the cortisol awakening response influences a lot. You think, oh, it's just cortisol. Like that can't influence very much. Ha! Huh. If it had a resume, it'd be a very long resume. It affects our alertness in the morning. It affects our energy levels our resiliency, like I said, our feelings of stressed out, our blood sugar management. As you know, um, or maybe don't know, cortisol, its main job is glucocorticoid, or is, is glucose management. It's a glucocorticoid steroid for a reason, gluco being glucose, that's what it does. It for sure helps with all this other stuff, but between your cortisol and your norepinephrine and epinephrine, that's a your main way for balancing and dealing with and triggering and, and breaking down and creating uh, glucose. Your car has a big influence on your autoimmune response, inflammation, infection, memory recall, and cancer outcomes. So the car is very specific. The cortisol awakening response um, happens in the first 30 minutes of you waking up. So my question is always the same. When you wake up in the morning, how long does it take you to feel alert and ready to go? And if it, you say to me, oh my gosh, within you know 10 or 20 minutes, I'm pretty good. I'm on, I'm ready to go. I'm Cinderella and the birds are flying around my head. Then you have a pretty good cortisol awakening response. But if you tell me it takes you two hours and two cups of coffee, your cortisol awakening response is not that great. You, it, it should take about 20 to 30 minutes. It should go up. Then it rebounds and comes down um, the, the recovery within at about the 60 minute mark and continues down um, throughout the rest of the day. So this is a, when we zoom in the cortisol awakening response curve, you would think, oh, that looks about the same as the other curve you showed me. This is a zoomed in version. So again, you collect on waking, you look at 30 minutes later, and you look at 30 minutes after that. Because I'm really trying to ascertain how do you do in that first 30 minutes in the morning? Can can you make this, the switch to alertness, right? Can you get going? How are you going to handle your blood sugar? How are you going to deal with inflammation? How are you going to um, mitigate autoimmune. And that first 30 minutes is what gives me a lot of those answers. So we use salivary testing for this part. It's a little bit different, of course, than urine. We use, use salivary because 
in order to evaluate the cortisol awakening response and the full circadian rhythm, we want to collect really rapidly in the morning and urine is just not able to do that. I mean, some people might be able to say they could urinate every 30 minutes, <laughs> but really we just want to like pop the swab in their mouth, collect on waking, uh, collect again 30 minutes later and collect again 30 minutes later. And at Dutch, we use the salivate swabs because it's easier um, and it's in more hospitable, especially for those with dry mouth, instead of passive drooling into a tube. Now, the problem with saliva, though, is that you cannot get the cortisol metabolites. Those only come from urine. And you cannot get the 11-beta HSD indicator. Again, that comes from urine. So you can do one or the other. Um, but maybe if you're really trying to get the whole picture, the best practice would be to combine the two, to have the, the salivate swab part of the saliva and then the urine part. So you get the cortisol awakening response. You get that rhythm through the day. You look at the metabolites to see if they're um, more of a cortisol person or a cortisone person to see that enzyme 11 beta HSD, and then of course to gather the other adrenal markers, DHEA, um, S, and then the norepinephrine and epinephrine markers known as HVA and VMA for those of you who do organic acids. So, big picture summary the HB axis starts in the brain. Remember, this is the fundamentals, so we're not talking about treatment, but I do need you to understand. When you're thinking of treatment, don't just ask me like, well, what's your favorite adaptogen? Because, I mean, I have a favorite adaptogen, but like, what's a favorite treatment? Because I don't know where, where's the issue, right? We have to determine where the issue is. Is it, and if it's at the brain, then we have to look at the brain. And then from there, the adrenal glands make cortisol, DHEA, DHEAS, aldosterone, and your catecholamines. Cortisol is a steroid hormone. It's made in the mitochondria. So maybe instead of your favorite adaptogen, we need to look at your favorite mitochondrial support. And it comes from cholesterol not circulating progesterone or pregnenolone. So if your patient's on a statin medication with really low cholesterol, maybe that's the problem. Cortisol should be highest in the morning, assuming you're on day shift, and lowest in the evening. And um, over time, the stress response can become overly hypersensitive and eventually result in low cortisol output. So if you have somebody in your, in your, in your practice with low cortisol, don't just ask me for something that's going to you know, wake up a dead horse. Like, let's backtrack and figure out why did they have high cortisol and why is the negative feedback loop kicked in? And then how can we overcome that negative feedback loop? Testing the CAR, the cortisol awakening response, helps evaluate resilience. So you're gonna ask that question to your patients when you wake up in the morning, how long does it take you to feel alert and ready to go? And the CAR plays a role in other important health out outcomes such as blood sugar response, inflammation, autoimmunity. And then lastly, DHEA has multiple functions in the brain and the body. And now you know how you get the S on and how you take the S off. And if the S is on, DHEA S, then it's inactive. Once you take the S off, it is inactive, or it is, it's active. The DHEA can then bind to receptors and do the things. So last couple slides, just if you're like, what is she talking about? I'm new to Dutch. How do I evaluate this? I don't do urine testing. You're about to become a pro. We have a few key tests that can be really helpful. So the Dutch Complete, four urine collections through the day. This is our flagship test. There's a fifth overnight collection if you have insomnia. So we look at all the sex hormones plus the metabolites, your testosterone, your DHT, your estrogen, your phase one, your phase two detoxification, et cetera. We do look at all the cortisol, cortisone, metabolites, and of course the pattern. The only thing this test doesn't look at is the cortisol awakening response. This is not the saliva part but it does look at melatonin. It does look at um, an antioxidant marker called HOHDG, nutritional and neurotransmitter metabolites. If you want the cortisol awakening response, then we do a combo test called the Dutch Plus, where we take everything from the complete, which is from the urine part, we add in five salivary swabs so you can do the cortisol awakening response, plus get the rest of the pattern throughout the day. And if your patient has insomnia, we have you covered there. You can do an extra overnight sample with that one. This one is more comprehensive collection requiring the two com the combo urine and uh, saliva swabs. This results in more data points for your patient care. And then as a complete aside, it has nothing to do with cortisol, but you can add it to your complete or your plus for your woman, your cycling woman who is or should be cycling. We have what's called a Dutch cycle mapping. This is where she collects one strip pretty much every day of her cycle, and we will graph out her estrogen and progesterone for her 
so she can and you can evaluate what is going on through her cycle. Why does she get migraines at ovulation and before her period? Why is fertility a concern for her? Why does she feel this way on day 16, day 18, and day 24 through 28? This gives you that, that macroscopic view, that uh, bird's eye view of her cycle, so you can start to answer those questions. And lastly, 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 the healing starts with you. So practitioner, heal yourself. Please, please don't be like Cruella DeVille, who's trying to excel in their career, keep proper distance, maintain a social life, sort of, on Zoom, drink enough water, exercise, text everyone back, stay sane, survive, and be happy. Your cortisol awakening response is going to drop down, down, down if you do not take care of yourself. And we do not want that. We want you to have healthy, robust levels of cortisol so that you can be alert, um, reduce your in inflammation, reduce your autoimmune risk, have healthy, normal levels of glucose, and so on. If you're new to Dutch, never been a part of Dutch before, we do have a fantastic, fantastic Become a Provider sign-up bonus where you can receive 50% off up to five test kits, any of the kits that we talked about today, when you sign up. So if you are uh, interested, you can definitely send us an email, sales at dutchtest.com. You can give us a call. You can check us out on our website and we are happy to help you. We have an entire sales team and we have an entire clinical team um, for those Dutch practitioners um, that need extra support. And that concludes our talk. So thank you everyone. I am just three minutes over of our hour long uh, webinar. And thank you so much for listening to this HPA Fundamentals. I hope you have a much better, much broader mm -hmm. understanding of what it takes to make cortisol, get cortisol to bind, get cortisol through the body, and, um, you know, really just how to improve it from all levels. Thanks, Carrie. Great presentation. I'm going to throw a few questions at you. I can't get to all of them, but I, I've picked out a few here. Sure. Um, would HPA access impact somebody that has developed POTS? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I am not a POTS expert. Um, I had in, in practice, I did have a couple of POTS patients and we found that the uh, stability or instability of their HPA access had a profound effect on their POTS symptoms. So um, yes. Uh oh, we lost Amy. And oh wait, I can't. Mean, sorry, I think. Um, in result. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I think, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. So, you is the enzyme? Again? Yep. Is the enzyme 11 beta HSD connected to re, to the release of cortisol while fasting, or is this oh. only due to toxins release? So 11 beta HSD is an is an enzyme. So it doesn't actually um, it's it's not like cortisol is released and it's concentrated in certain areas of your body. So the enzyme could be upregulated or downregulated depending on the need at the moment. So for example, um, let's take adipose tissue for is is an example. So if you have an upregulated 11 beta HSD in your adipose tissue, then you might have or probably will have a higher level of cortisol activation in that site, as opposed to maybe um, in the saliva glands or the kidney glands, um, you're gonna it's gonna be the opposite for, um, depending the amount of cortisol coming through, your body will deactivate it. So with intermittent fasting, um, it depends how long you intermittent fast, right? So somebody who does 12 hours is different from somebody who does 22 hours of intermittent fasting. And so um, the enzyme, that 11 beta HS2, your 5-alpha reductase and the way your brain signals down to your mitochondria and the mitochondria itself are all bio-individually affected by your fasting. And we definitely know that it's like male versus female and we know female cycling and we know it's different with the females depending where they are in their cycling. And so unfortunately, I don't have a like standard canned answer. All I can say is intermittent fasting can affect all those things with cortisol, and it can affect that enzyme. But it, I, I don't, I don't. T we don't tend to see. Um, I don't have a trend. Like I, I couldn't tell you that intermittent fasting in all women who cycle, as they get close to their period, the enzyme goes up. As an example, um, but we do know it does. A, it, intermittent fasting, especially the longer you do it, can absolutely affect it. So if you feel like it's affecting you negatively, um, I've had people say, I jumped in intermittent fasting. I feel like my sugars are a mess. I feel like my cord you know, like I cortisol is over the all over the place. I'm like, okay, just let's the 
there are other things going on. Let's address that before we jump back into uh, intermittent fasting. And other people are the opposite. Other people begin intermittent fasting. Let's say they do the 16-8 plan and they're like, oh my gosh, it's been a game changer. I feel like I have better clarity. I feel like I have better energy through the day. I feel like my blood sugar is better balanced. And again, I think it's pretty bio-individual. Long answer. I apologize. But no, no, you're, you that's, that's great. Um, let's see. Let me flip it around. Um, I've got somebody asking, is there a way to increase the MAO? I know you were talking about that with stress yes. response. Yes. Yeah. So, um, um, yes, that's a, that's a whole other webinar and a whole other book. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely encourage you to, um, you know, do some research online because you will find some, you will find some good resources on understanding the MAO better. Um, that's better than the Q and A section of, of this webinar, but yes, you can support it. Okay. Let's see. Um, do tricyclic antidepressants affect the cortisol awakening response test? <gasps> Tricyclic. Yeah, tricyclic. Um, Let me think about this. Um, I have to look that one up. I don't remember if the tricyclics do. It's not, okay. not off the top of my head, but I'd have to look it up to be really specific. I do know the tricyclics can affect mitochondria. I do know that, um, but the actual car itself um, the, uh, the response of the car, I would have, let me look, I'll have to look that one up. Okay. Um, what is the time reference for chronic stress? Um, I've been told it's any time from one to three or one hour to three days. Yep. So it definitely can be depend on the person and how resilient that they are. So somebody as an example, like divorce is a really great example. If somebody is, um, going through a, a nasty divorce as an example, and, but they're handling it really pretty well. They have been uh, you know, maybe managing or testing their cortisol, then their definition of chronic stress is different than maybe somebody else who's going, the, the other partner going through divorce, and it's completely affecting their cortisol, their cortisol awakening and response, their cortisol rhythm and everything. So chronic stress, an hour of chronic stress, like for, if you watched a horribly scary movie documentary for an hour straight, is that going to, is that going to completely cause your parasympathetic, sympathetic systems to go into meltdown probably not um but if it you were you know if it was days if not weeks then i would say yes absolutely i had a we at dutch we we got the result of a a night shift firefighter and um i thought oh my gosh this is going to be the worst cortisol i've ever seen and this firefighter had the greatest cortisol pattern I had ever seen. She is my hero. And so it just goes to show she was night shift and a firefighter. Oh, and she did her Dutch test while attending to car accidents. Thank you very much. And her circadian rhythm was perfect. Like she just managed it. That even wasn't her chief complaint. Fatigue, insomnia, stress, that wasn't her complaint, which just goes to show like some people, I would have, I would have not handled that one very well. I would not be a very good firefighter. So Again, it's bio-individual, but testing helps you figure that out. Testing in history, testing history and symptoms helps you figure that out. So um, what if a patient has too much inactive cortisone? How can you balance that? And you might have touched on that. Yes. But um, so if you're, so on the Dutch test, if you are leaning to T-H-E and you have more cortisone, we have two common reasons. One, of course, is long-term stress um, and or long-term illness, or excuse me, long-term or acute illness where the body's like, okay, it's time to rest, it's time to slow down, let's start to inactivate um, because there's just way too much cortisol. So number one is address the cause, go after the long-term stress, work with them on their acute um, or their infections and inflammation that is driving this factor. The quick Band-Aid is licorice root. Licorice root will reactivate cortisone into cortisol. You do have to be careful with licorice root though, it can raise blood pressure and it can deplete potassium, it can cause hypokalemia. So be careful of your dose and be careful of how long you use it and make sure you're following up with their blood pressure and um, you know, do check on their potassium levels um, with a blood draw if you plan to use it you know, for any length of time. But, that's, but that does, licorice root also doesn't address the cause. So if, if they've got long-term stress, whether it's you know, 
the current situation, whether it's work stress, whether it's family stress, whether it's illness, you still have to address that. Okay. So I'm going to throw one more question at you. Mm -hmm. um, is melatonin a good indicator of serotonin levels since the serotonin is a precursor? That is actually a really great question. And I'll be honest, um, on Dutch test, we used to run um, a few years ago, a marker, a metabolite called 5-HIAA, which is the metabolite of serotonin. And while that marker can also uh, vary, just like the, the catecholamine metabolites, they, all, they didn't always sync up. It wasn't like melatonin was low, therefore 5-HIAA was low and vice versa. So I, I don't use melatonin um, as a good indicator of, of um, serotonin levels uh, only because um, central serotonin and, and peripheral are, are different. So, right. And even though in the Dutch test, we're collecting uh, partly what's pineal, we're also collecting though what's, you know, serotonin and our melatonin, like a lot is made in the gut. And so we're catching that as well. So you may have normal levels of serotonin in the brain and, the, and, you're, and, and it's a gut problem or vice versa. You may have central serotonin issues and pineal issues, um, but you're, you know, the gut's fine. So I, I don't, I don't look at melatonin as a serotonin look, although I know, understand the pathway. Well, let me throw one more question at you. I've got somebody that's asked, um, how often would you uh, advise a practitioner to uh, retest with the Dutch test? So depends what you're looking at and how they're feeling. On average, I suggest every three or three to six months. So if you think about a, a cycling woman with ovaries and um, follicular genesis, so from the act of going from the primordial follicle up to the chosen ovulatory follicle is three months. So whether you're working on cortisol hormones or both, um, I say in cycling women with ovaries, give it at least three months. Um, but if you get to the three month mark and you're asking the person, the patient, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And they're like, man, you know what? You've changed my life. I feel like 70% better. I'd like to keep going. Then save your money or save their money. Don't test. Maybe don't maybe retest at the six month mark and see how they're doing. But if at the three or four month mark, they're like, gosh, you know, you know, some things are better, but some things aren't. And I just really don't feel like everything's working. Then go ahead and retest. And then after that, let's say I, we had to totally have practitioners that do just the one year thing. So they just have them come in for their, you know, yearly check in. They run a Dutch to see, you know, what's going on. Maybe they're on hormones. Maybe they're, you know, monitoring something and they just do it every year. Great. Thank you. So uh, that's our last question. I'm going to have our ans uh, have Dr. Jones answer. I just want to remind all of you who are still on with us, we will send the recording uh, tomorrow, probably sometime after lunchtime, uh, West Coast time. Um, and want to thank you again for joining us and spending this uh, hour, hour 15 minutes with us. So thanks, everyone. Uh, our next webinar Wednesday will be March 24th. We will be doing another foundational lecture on the HPO axis. So thanks again. Thanks, Dr. Jones. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy.